Hi everyone, today I'm going to be reviewing Harrow the Ninth, the sequel to Gideon the Ninth. This book came out just about a week ago, I think, at the time I'm recording this, and it was really crazy. This was probably my most anticipated release this summer after Empire of Gold, which came out last month. So yeah, ever since I finished Gideon the Ninth a couple of months ago, I've been really dying to get my hands on this book. For those of you that watched a book haul video I did a little while ago, I wanted to get a copy with black pages, but as you can see, this is just a regular copy. I looked it up online, it seems like there were some ways to maybe pre-order the special books that had black pages, but I decided to just get it normally and not worry about it. So that dream will have to uh, wait for another day, but that's okay. Um, more importantly, I want to talk about, you know, what's inside the book because it was really hard to imagine what a sequel to Gideon the Ninth would be like, and this book was kind of nuts. Usually when I talk about a new release where I want to share some thoughts that are spoilers, I divide the review up into a few sections, so I'm going to do that with this book today. I'll start out by giving a spoiler-free review, and then I will give some spoilers, but I will be very clear about when I am moving on to spoilers, so if you haven't read the book yet and you also haven't read Gideon the Ninth, you can still watch the first part of this review. Even now that I've finished it and I enjoyed it, I feel like I'm not completely sure what I read, and of course that means I am dying to get my hands on book three. It's supposed to come out next year, but I don't think we even have a release date yet, so I'm gonna have to wait for a while, which kind of sucks. This is the middle book in a trilogy, which we know is probably the most awkward point. It's the hardest book to write because it's kind of the middle of the story. It doesn't really feel like it has a beginning or an end, so I kind of feel like Tamsin Muir just decided to torture us as much as possible since it was already the middle book of the trilogy. So yeah, I guess I would say that it was torture in a good way. I didn't think it was possible for the series to really get crazier after Gideon the Ninth, which was kind of a wacky book, but I definitely feel like she made it crazier in Harrow. Also, just as a note about the series, I've mentioned a lot of times on this channel that I'm very squeamish and hate body horror, so I don't know why I love this series about necromancy so much. I think if you told me straight up a bunch of the things that go on in these books and some of the things that happen to people, I would be totally grossed out and say I would never read a book like that, but somehow the way it's done is just both kind of like humorous and cartoonish and just like so engagingly written that I really don't feel disturbed reading it, so I don't really know why this is. This is a book, I said this about Gideon too, this is a series that I should not love as much as I do just based on the content and subject matter, but it has definitely totally captivated me. Something about Tamsin Muir's writing just hits this weird combination of like funny and awful and matter of fact that just kind of makes it all work for me. It's kind of hard to explain why. After finishing this, I can honestly say I have no idea what to expect for book three. Probably the main question to ask is whether I loved this as much as book one, and the answer is kind of yes and no. I didn't love it in the same way, and I didn't love it as much right off the bat, but I did find it really compelling, and I actually feel like when I reread Gideon the Ninth and then Harrow the Ninth, I'm gonna find a lot more stuff in it as well, a lot more details, and I think I loved the complexity and I loved all the things that she was putting in there to start to build out this story and the world, but I didn't just like totally fall in love with the characters in the story in exactly the same way I did for Gideon. I think that's actually pretty normal. Again, this is the middle book. You're never gonna get that feeling of discovering something with the second book the way you do with the first book, so as long as the second book doesn't let you down and makes you want to keep reading, I think that's pretty successful. But it does mean that it's just, right now, it doesn't hold exactly the same place in my heart. I think what this book did achieve was that it managed to totally surprise me and subvert all of my expectations, and I think that's really cool, especially considering that I didn't even know what to expect after Gideon the Ninth, which was also kind of a crazy book. So yeah, I did spend a lot of the time I was reading this book just wondering like what the heck is going on, and 
I haven't done any reading vlogs before, but I think if you had been filming me while reading this, I was getting up like every chapter and pacing in circles and being like, oh my god, I, I don't know what's happening right now. But I kind of, I enjoyed that experience a lot. And there was a certain amount of payoff for that. I think there's actually going to be even more payoff for it in book three, I hope. What makes a book a really great reading experience for me is when I get to the end and I immediately want to go back and reread it. And I totally did get that from this book, so I think that in my eyes makes it really successful. And what's more, it made me want to go back and reread Gideon immediately as well. So I think for me that means this book accomplished what it needed to and even more than that. I have a lot of new thoughts and feelings and theories about the characters and the world and yeah, so I'm still very much into this series and as strange as this book is, I definitely don't feel like it was a disappointment. Just to talk about a few bigger picture aspects of this series before I get on to the spoiler portion, the world building in Gideon the Ninth was something I mentioned as slightly problematic, although it didn't bother me in the end because Gideon was sort of a very short-sighted character, um, but I felt like by the end of the book it was starting to expand more and I was starting to get more of a picture of the world, I actually kind of feel like world building might still be a weakness in this series depending on what your concept of world building is. I think the mythology of the series, the overall big picture about how everything works, a lot of stuff was basically starting to get explained in this book, but some of the things I expected to get explained or expected to see more of I totally didn't, and I think it just the story was going in a slightly different direction and different themes and just some different stuff than where I expected it was going to get to. So I don't know, I can't really say that the world building is really strong in this series. I think the mythology of it is really strong. I think if you want detailed world building where things make sense and you get really a clear picture of the whole setting, the whole world, this doesn't really provide and that's something I just have to accept right now. It kind of feels more like world building as theater rather than really detailed world building. I guess it's going to take until book three to see how much gets fleshed out and how much is just that's the way it is in this setting, but it's still a setting I really enjoy spending time in, maybe even more so because of the characters and the snark and the writing more than the actual setting. Several new characters do get introduced in this book and I continue to like them. I like them even as much or more than some of the characters from the first book. I think character is an area where this series, to me, is really strong. I know it's also an area that some people really didn't like in Gideon. Like, Gideon is a very polarizing character and some people hated her point of view in the first book and some people really loved it, so I think that's probably true in Harrow as well. Either you're going to like the characters or you're just gonna not like the tone and not like the characters and this just won't be for you. A lot of the plot in the first book was very self-contained, even though the ending was not completely conclusive, but I can't say that that's the case here. I think this is very much connected to both what came before and what's coming after, so if you're the kind of person that that would bother, maybe wait till book three is out before you read the series. I decided not to reread Gideon the Ninth before I read this because it's only been a few months since I read it, like maybe three or four, and that ended up being okay for me. I ended up actually kind of wishing I reread Gideon before this. Normally my memory for characters and plots is very strong and I don't necessarily need to reread something just to pick up on all the details, but there were just so many complicated details in this book and so many characters and there were a few times where it took a second for something to come back to me and that's why also I feel like I'm going to appreciate this book even more after I read Gideon carefully looking for clues and find some more details. There are definitely other books I've read that are stronger in terms of plot or setting or world building, but I just really feel like Tamsin Muir's writing is just something completely unique. I think it's obviously something that not everybody enjoys, although I really enjoy it. I enjoy the craziness of it. It's very evocative. It's very powerful. A lot of what she writes just hits you in the gut all the time, but it's also very funny. So I think that's really where the strength of this series is for me and why I find it to be so unique. The voice and style for this book are kind of pretty different from Gideon the Ninth. I don't want to say too much more about that because spoilers, but I would say that everything in this book, like the writing, is just as unique as it was in Gideon the Ninth. It's just unique in a different way. 
And when I'm saying that her writing is unique, I don't mean necessarily that it's super experimental. I just feel like the voice and the way it transports me are very different than other things that I've experienced. I kind of feel like I'm having a different experience when I read this series. Okay, now for some spoilers. Normally in a review like this, I do a section where I would talk about things that were spoilers for Gideon the Ninth but not for Harrow the Ninth. That's what I did for my Empire of Gold review. But honestly, it feels very hard to say anything about this book um, without spoiling something. So this is gonna be really, really short. There's just a couple of things I want to say that will you know, interest people that have read Gideon and not this book, but then I'm just gonna move on to complete spoilers because there's honestly not much I can say. Like things just get so crazy from the very, very beginning that it's a little bit hard to talk about without giving stuff away. And if you've read Gideon and you're planning to read this, I want you to be able to enjoy that surprise the way I did. So if you read Gideon and you read the end, it's no surprise that this book is sort of from the perspective of Harrow and her perspective is very different than Gideon's. Gideon was sort of a narrow-minded, hyper-focused jock who was not super aware of what was going on around her. What I thought was really interesting about Harrow's perspective is that the way she looks at the world is just so different than Gideon. She basically sees everybody as a bunch of bones covered by some meat or you know depending on what you're looking at in this world maybe there's just bones and she describes everything very anatomically anatomically and she describes everything very anatomically when harrow describes a character you really get no mental picture of what that person looks like in my opinion and if you got a description of the same character from someone else's perspective like you you would just you would not know what was happening, but it also made a really unique perspective. Obviously, Harrow just isn't as much fun as Gideon. She's kind of a ball of trauma, but I did still enjoy her personality and her perspective. The other thing I can say, because you'll get it from the very, very first page, so I can't really call it a spoiler, is that some big chunks of this book are in second person, and I know that's gonna throw some people off, Weirdly, for me, it is something that doesn't really bother me. There's a few books that have come out lately that were very successful that used second person. N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy used it first. I think that's why other authors are starting to experiment with it, because Jemisin did such a good job with it. Uh, the Raven Tower, which I just read a couple of weeks ago, was in second person, and I actually really liked that. So I think, for me, second person is something that I adapt to kind of quickly in terms of reading it and not having it really interrupt the flow, but I know it's something that really, really bothers some people. I would definitely encourage you to just stick it out with this book. There are reasons for this, there are sort of reasons for everything, and the whole book is not in second person, but a good portion of it is, so just bear with it. You will also find in the first few chapters that there are two prologues and then the opening and each one of those seems to be taking place in a different time frame. In general this book has a ton of jumping around, it's not always clear what's happening, and it takes quite a while for that to come together. That seems to be intentional, um, so you just kind of have to accept that and enjoy the ride and eventually a lot more will become clear. Okay, so now I'm going to move on and actually talk about spoilers for Harrow the Ninth. So this is the part where I have to tell my husband to go ahead and leave the room and put on some headphones because he just started this book yesterday and he's about 30 pages in and I think he's completely confused right now and I don't want to spoil it for him, so we're going to send him away. Okay, so now my husband is in another room. He has his ears covered. He's probably listening to his Words of Radiance audiobook right now. Um, so I can talk about some spoilers for real. I almost didn't even let him take this book from me because I kind of want to reread Gideon and then reread this again and he is a much slower reader than me, sorry. Um, but I also have a lot of other stuff to read right now including several books I was in the middle of when this arrived in the mail. It actually came a couple days before I expected so that was a really pleasant surprise. It was in a box with some kitchen tongs that I had ordered and I was surprised when I opened up my box of tongs and there was Harrow. Okay, so spoilers. I was like 90% sure in this book from the very beginning that Gideon was the one narrating and that the second person narration was from her. 
Um, that doesn't mean there weren't points where I started to doubt, but I was pretty positive that that was what was going on. And I have to say, it was still super satisfying when we got the reveal that that was the case and we really got Gideon's full perspective. It made me realize just how much I missed her in the rest of the book. I think her perspective is what really made the first book what it was, and Harrow is kind of a depressing ball of trauma sometimes, and she has very good reasons for that. Um, Gideon just isn't, and even though she could be, I think just she chooses to be Gideon instead. So that was just super satisfying when we finally got Gideon's point of view fully, and we knew that she was really the one that was narrating all along, and I really, really enjoyed the chapters from her perspective at the end. I also enjoyed the reveal about her parentage. Honestly, I know that was kind of a mystery in the first book, but I, I wasn't really thinking about it anymore. Like, I wasn't really wondering where she came from or who she was. I didn't think it was necessarily going to be important to the story. But I thought, even so, that reveal was actually pretty well handled. I think reveals about people being the children of other people, it can be kind of overdone. It's not always the greatest. In this case, it totally surprised me. I thought it worked. I'm really curious to know how that's going to affect Gideon uh, in future books or like what it means for her other than the backstory. Does it give her any different powers or anything like that? I mean, she, as far as we know, is not a necromancer. Maybe she wasn't born on a planet with necromancy. I guess she was kind of born in space. So I really hope that we get more Gideon perspective in book three. I think it is fairly clear, we can all say at this point, that anyone who dies at any point is fair game to come back in some form or another. Uh, inhabiting corpses seems like a totally viable option for a lot of people or, you know, getting put back into bodies. It seems like at the end, somebody is definitely in Gideon's body. I'm not sure if it's Gideon or Harrow or Electo or what, but yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It's a series where necromancy is sort of the main thing that's going on. So nobody is gone. And I really enjoyed getting to see characters from book one again. I wasn't really expecting that. I was silly enough to think that the people who were supposedly dead at the end of book one were going to stay that way. Um, none of them really did, whether it was that pocket dimension thing or the ones that actually survived or the ones that seemed like they really shouldn't have survived but are still alive. I'm looking forward to finding out what's going on with them, the ones that got rescued from Canaan House at the end, and you know, what the heck is Blood of Eden really, and what are they doing, and obviously the Emperor is up to some nefarious stuff, or was, he's probably still alive too, I don't think we've seen the end of him. But we never really get an explanation for like, what what is the Empire, what's the Emperor really even doing? He has some sort of war of conquest? Why are the Lictors killing all these planets? I don't know, it's just, there's a lot that does not get explained in this book. When we first started getting the earlier timeline in this book from Harrow's perspective, where Ortis was the cavalier instead of Gideon, at first I didn't even realize that that was like an alternate timeline because it seemed like that meeting between Ortis and Harrow could have technically maybe happened before the start of Gideon the Ninth. Um, but then it became pretty quickly clear that that wasn't what was going on and that she had completely forgotten Gideon. At least I was assuming that she had forgotten Gideon. I didn't really even have a theory for why. The reveal that she had done it herself. I think that, I think that was the best way that could have been done. Like I really liked that. That sort of the whole plot of this book is actually about Harrow grieving Gideon and that loss, even though for the whole book she has prevented herself from remembering in a way to try to preserve Gideon, to not consume her soul, but she just, because of that, she isn't able to actually grieve either, like the way she needs to, but you can tell that on the inside there are little clues, there are ways that she is grieving and dealing with that loss, but it's completely not on the surface because she doesn't remember anything. It was also really interesting getting all those scenes from things that happened in the first book, but in the alternate timeline and just from Harrow's perspective with the same characters, but different events. And I think that's an area where there's going to be a lot more um, that I can get out of it from rereading Gideon and then rereading Harrow right after that. I think there's a lot more information about the world and what's going on and probably secret things that I just didn't pick up on in this book because I was so 
confused for a lot of the time, but it was really nice getting to revisit those characters again. It was nice to see Harrow actually getting to know them a little bit more as well, and I know a lot of them, like uh, Abigail, are kind of fan favorites as well, and I mean she and Magnus are really awesome characters. I was really happy to get to spend more time with them. I was surprised by how much I really liked Ortis as a character, because in Gideon, uh, he's just totally a throwaway character. He gets blown up pretty early and we just that I never I never expected that he would come back and be like an important character in book two. That was the last thing that I ever expected. But he was just surprisingly a character that I kind of loved, even though his personality is basically just gloom and maybe not very good epic poetry, but there's just something really appealing about his personality as a counterpoint to Harrow, and I'm kind of curious to see him and Gideon maybe interact in the future as well. There was something like just weirdly touching about his personality, like I can see why he drives Harrow crazy, but he's just like sort of so solid and yet so stubborn and then just the whole like being obsessed with the epic poem that he's writing. I don't know, I, I really liked him as a character and he developed and had some really awesome moments in this book and I just, that shocks me. I had no idea that I would like him so much. I also thought the reveal that the third Lictor was actually named Gideon and not Ortis was really cool. I think it's really nice. I like how the extra materials in this book, kind of like the character list at the beginning even, support the confusion of Harrow's memories and what's going on. Like you have Ortis the first in all caps, as if, you know, like that has been replaced in your mind. And then where uh, everyone else just has a cavalier that is crossed out, um, Gideon or whoever that is, we don't know, has been totally blacked out instead, I thought, I, I like when there are little extra design touches like that, and I thought the reveal of the name of the Lictor being Gideon was really fun as well. I was definitely, I was pretty sure that Harrow had forgotten Gideon for some reason, like that something had been done to her, but there were definitely times where I was totally questioning everything, like did the first book even happen, like what's, what's going on here? So yeah, I, I enjoyed that sense of confusion, but I could see why somebody would find it kind of frustrating. I also, I really enjoyed the Lictors as well. I know some people have said they didn't really like Mercy Morn and Augustine and Gideon slash Ortis. Um, I have like a soft spot for stories about immortal characters and what immortality means and all of that stuff. So maybe that's why this series is also kind of really um, doing it for me. I think that the story of the lictors and their cavaliers and that sacrifice seems to be kind of the core story of this series. I think that's probably the idea that she started out with. I saw her say somewhere like when she designed necromancy there was one specific thing that she wanted to have necromancy do which was people becoming lictors and that it was all like reverse engineered from that. So I think the first book was basically about learning what that sacrifice was and also developing the bond between Gideon and Harrow to the point where that was very emotional and powerful and also the bonds that you could see with the other characters. And then this book in a way was just about Harrow mourning Gideon and like what that did to her psychologically even though she can't even remember it most of the time or you know for most of the book until she gets to a point where she does remember. But that was honestly, like that's kind of the emotional core of the book is something that's absent, which I thought was really cool and powerful. It seems pretty clear that's going to be the theme in book three as well, that we will find out more about Electo and about the Emperor. I feel like I was waiting the whole book to find out who Electo was because it was announced from the beginning that book three was called Electo the Ninth. So obviously there's got to be someone named Electo and we haven't had them yet. And as soon as the AL thing got revealed that there was a character called AL, I was thinking like that has to be Electo because literally there's just nobody else left and I don't think the third book is going to be about somebody that just gets chucked in randomly. So that was still a cool plot and reveal. I'm looking forward to figuring out, you know, what is this perfect Lictorhood? Is it really perfect? You know, Electo, AL, who was she? There's a lot we don't know. But how cool is it that the very last thing in the book was just, um, the tomb will open in Electo the Ninth. Dun 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 dun. 
that definitely builds some anticipation for me, I have to say. I feel like I could make a whole separate video that's just me saying what the heck is going on in this series. I don't even know, like, what is this? But here's a theory I feel pretty confident about. I'm almost positive that this universe, even the solar system, that this is our solar system, that probably the abandoned um, house at the first is Earth. It seems pretty obvious that John was uh, from our world, probably not too far in the future, and that he somehow like destroyed and resurrected everything, that Dominicus is the sun, that the nine houses match up with the planets in our solar system somehow, and I think we're gonna find out a lot more about that backstory and about what happened, but especially like John makes all these pop culture references, so I think pretty clearly this is our world somehow. So yeah, I have like no idea what's happening beyond that theory, but I feel like this is really the make it or break it point in the series, right? Like I loved book one, book two. Overall, I really enjoyed it. I feel like it's going to be up to book three, whether this is a great series or just a really weird one. I am looking forward to book three. I don't want to have to wait a year. That's kind of rough. But yeah, this is always the scary point in a trilogy, right? It's not like each book is going to stand on its own. I'll probably always enjoy Gideon, but I am really looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts on this series and what you all thought. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know down in the comments what you thought of this book, and um, yeah.